Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I am Takashi Ishida and I am a lecturer at the University of Tokyo um, and visiting scientist at Riken AIP. And we have been uh, hosting Trust ML Young Scientist Seminars or Trust ML YSS, uh, which is a seminar series that features young scientists giving talks and discoveries in relation with trustworthy machine learning uh, led by Jingfeng. And today is the 29th uh, seminar, and I am excited to have Kevin Ithayaraj to give us a talk about understanding dataset difficulty with uh, V usable information. Um, Kevin is a PhD student and Facebook fellow at Stanford NLP, where he is advised by Dan Jurafsky. He was previously a BMO National Scholar and John H. Moss Scholar at the University of Toronto, where he was advised by Graham Hurst and David Duvinod. Uh, his research focuses on the end-to-end -end evaluation of NLP systems from representation-centric evaluation uh, to data-centric evaluation, which I think he will talk about today, uh, to human-centric evaluation. Um, so, Kevin, uh, we are very excited to learn about your research, and if you are ready, uh, please begin. All right. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, very much an honor to be here today. So the title of this work is Understanding Dataset Difficulty with the Usable Information, which was presented recently at ICML 2022, where uh, we were um, very honored to receive an outstanding paper award from the committee there. This is work done with Yejin Choi and Swaba Soyam Dipta at um, Allen AI, where I was interning when I worked on this project. So the task of understanding data set difficulty can really be broken down into a set of more granular comparisons. Uh, one such comparison is comparing two models. Another is comparing data sets in their entirety. A third is comparing individual instances in the data set. Fourth would be com uh, comparing different slices of the data set, for example, different classes. and the last would be comparing different attributes of the input. For example, in NLP, this might be something like short versus long sentences or a different types of uh, sentence structure. And so being able to com co conduct comparisons in all five of these facets, it's crucial to understanding data set difficulty. And yet the measures we typically use only allow us to conduct one or two or maybe three of these comparisons. For example, a metric like accuracy or F1 score only allows us to really compare two models with respect to the same data set. If we wanted to compare two different data sets with respect to the same model, what is typically done in the literature is looking at the gap between the human performance and the performance of a state-of-the-art model. And the bigger the gap is, the harder one data set is set to be relative to another. And this line of argument is often used when proposing a new data set for a particular topic. And this is just a handful of the methods that have been proposed in the literature on how to conduct some of these comparisons, but none of them allow us to make all five comparisons. For example, data set cartography by Swayam Dipta et al. uses training dynamics to understand how difficult some instances in a particular data set are to learn for a given model family. And it allows us to also compare some slices of the data, but it doesn't allow us to really interpret the difficulty and understand why some instances may be difficult compared to another. On the other hand, an approach like minimum description length is quite useful for understanding the relative difficulty of input attributes and understanding what attributes the model learns in order to perform well on a particular distribution. But because it's sensitive to the ordering of the data, it doesn't really make sense to use MDL for comparing two different instances in a data set. And so the goal of, our v of applying our V information framework is 
to be able to do all five of these comparisons under the same umbrella in some capacity. Note that I'll be using the terms the information and the usable information interchangeably uh, throughout the talk, but they refer to the same thing. Now to understand how this works at a very high level, um, let me give you an example. Say I want to predict the sentiment of a sentence. Now, if I fed the raw text into a linear model, it probably wouldn't do too well because linear models typically don't operate very well on raw text. But if I took this text and I transformed it into a Burton embedding, then suddenly this task does become feasible for a linear model. And this is despite the fact that according to the data processing inequality, the amount of information the amount of Shannon information between the transformed input and the sentiment label can be no greater than that of the original input and the label. So intuitively, why does this work? Well, it's because transforming the input via this transformation can make information that was previously unusable by the model family V now usable. And so in their seminal work, Zhu et al. made this observation and they put forth the predictive V information framework for measuring the amount of usable information that uh, an input variable X contains about some output variable Y with respect to a given model family V. And so this quantity, which is uh, V information or V usable information, can be broken down into two terms. The first term denoted in blue is the V entropy of Y. And this is estimated by training or fine tuning a model to predict the label using what's called a null input. And a null input is something that provides no information really about the label. And so the goal here is to basically model the label entropy as best possible using the model family V. The second term is called the conditional uh, the entropy of Y given X. And this term is estimated by training or fine tuning a model the typical way using the actual input X with the aim of uh, predicting Y. And so you might notice that these terms bear a strong resemblance to the Shannon entropy and the conditional Shannon entropy of Y given X. And this isn't a coincidence. In fact, if you pose no restriction on V, that is V can encompasses a set of all possible functions, then um, V information does reduce to Shannon information. However, if you're restricting V to a particular model family, uh, then the information is going to be some quantity less than the Shannon information. So intuitively, what we extended, uh, the way in which we extended the information is we said, the lower the V usable information is, the more difficult the data set can be said to be for model family V. That is in other words, what we, we frame data set difficulty as the lack or absence of V usable information. So to test this out experimentally, we considered three canonical data sets in NLP. The first is SNLI, and for those who are unfamiliar, this is a natural language inference uh, data set where the goal is to predict whether a hypothesis entails, contradicts, or is neutral to a given premise. So for example, women enjoying a game of ping pong entails the premise, women enjoying a game of, a game of table tennis. Multi-NLI is a similar data set that contains data from multiple different domains. And lastly, COLA is a grammaticality detection data set where the goal is simply to predict whether a, uh, whether a particular 
text is grammatical or ungrammatical in nature. So how can we compare different models with the VA information framework? Well, this can be done uh, by simply computing the, the information for the same input and output variables and by comparing what those different amounts of usable information are. And here we do this for the SNLI data set, where we see that of the four models we compared, the model that extracted the most usable information was BART base, which is the largest of the four. It's also worth noting that uh, we trained the model on a different split of the data before estimating the V information on the test set. And this estimate of the V information peaks at epoch two of training before declining thereafterwards due to overfitting. And so this is important to keep in mind when trying to estimate the V information in practice. It's also worth noting that the V information estimate declines earlier and more steeply due to overfitting compared to the accuracy. And this is because models tend to become less certain about the correct label before they start making a wrong prediction outright. So the information declines before the accuracy declines. And this also suggests that the information may have some use in detecting overfitting. Secondly, we can compare different input attributes by comparing, by estimating the V info for the same Y and model family V, but for different input variables XI. That is, we transform the input uh, uh, with various transformations and then see how that changes the V information estimate. So here we applied three different transformations to the input in the SNLI data set. And we found that some attributes are much more important to prediction than others. For example, shuffling the tokens is does not reduce the amount of usable information by that much, suggesting that token order is not that important to predicting the label in SNLI. And this is somewhat surprising given that natural language inference is fundamentally a causal relationship. And so this suggests that these data sets are perhaps not as difficult as the tasks they purport to reflect. The second transformation we applied was removing the premise and only removing the premise and only keeping the hypothesis. And here we observe that even without the premise, it's possible to extract a good deal of usable information about the label. And this confirms prior findings uh, in the NLP literature, which found that the hypothesis often contains what's called annotation artifacts, that is spurious correlations that make it possible to predict the label even without the premise. So for example, in contradiction examples, negation words like not or never will be indicative of contradiction um, even in absence of there being a premise. And also the hypothesis in SNLI is unique to every example. And so it's possible to learn um, to predict the label even without the premise. On the other hand, if we just looked at the premise, we would see that it contains no usable information about the label. And this is because multiple premises, the same premise is shared by multiple examples in SNLI, making it hard to learn anything useful about the label with just the premise. Now, what if we wanted to measure the instance level difficulty? Because of course, just looking at the data set in its entirety does not tell us the whole story um, about how and why the data set is difficult. So we propose measuring the instance level difficulty with respect to a given distribution using pointwise V information. And so pointwise V information or PVI for short is to V information as PMI is to Shannon information. That is, the expected PVI equals 
the V information uh, for input variables X and output variable Y. One thing to keep in mind though, is that while the overall V information is non-negative, um, the PVI of individual examples in the data set can indeed be negative, as is the case with PMI. Now, you might think that because we're trying to measure the difficulty of individual instances, that this might be a volatile measure. It turns out that in practice, uh, this is not too much of a concern. If we looked at the cross epoch Pearson correlation um, between PVI estimates over time, we'd find that it's actually very high. It's about 0 0.75 or higher. And what this implies is that what a model tends to find difficult stays fairly consistent over the course of training. Very little of what a model finds difficult can also be ascribed to chance. Uh, despite some recent findings finding that uh, model performance can vary quite drastically across different random seeds, we find that the cross-seed Pearson correlation between PVI estimates of this same uh, set of examples is actually very high. It's 0 0.877 or higher, suggesting that very little of what a model finds difficult, at least in the data sets we tested, can be ascribed to random chance. And to reiterate a prior point, we would interpret PVI in a very similar way uh, to how we would interpret the usable information. That is, the greater the PVI value is, the easier the instance uh, can be set to be for model family V with respect to a particular distribution, uh, PXY. And this note about the distribution is important because a, the same example can have two different PVI values in two different distributions. For example, uh, if we had a review, for example, about a restaurant and the same review was in a movie review data set, it would ostensibly have a much lower PVI value in the movie review data set because it would be sort of out of distribution um, compared to the restaurant review data set to which it originally belonged. And so it's important to keep in mind that when we are estimating the PVI, it is with respect to a particular distribution. With PVI, we can compare um, different data sets by not only estimating the overall of the information, but by also comparing the distribution of PVI values while holding the model family constant. So here we have the distribution of PVI values for the three data sets I mentioned earlier, COLA, multi-NLI, and SNLI. Now, you might recall that multi-NLI and SNLI actually are data sets for the same task, that is natural language inference. And yet they have differing levels of difficulty with SNLI having a higher average PVI, i.e. a lower level of difficulty than the multi-NLI counterpart, ostensibly because multi-NLI contains data from uh, multiple different domains, not just one. And it's also worth noting that the vast majority of instances uh, in SNLI are quite easy, and it has a very Pareto distribution. In contrast, multi-NLI is a little more balanced. However, in contrast to both of the NLI data sets, our grammaticality detection data set, which is COLA, is um, much more difficult than both. Not only is its overall difficulty much greater as uh, shown by the dotted line denoting the average PVI value, but it's, the distribution of PVI values is also much more balanced and closer to the mean rather than um, exhibiting the strong skew that we see with the other two data sets. <laughs> 
Another interesting pattern that we observed is that the PVI threshold at which these predictions start being correct is consistent across uh, different data sets, or at least similar across different data sets. And this is despite the fact that the label space differs across the data sets. So at about a PVI of 0.5, predictions go from being mostly incorrect as denoted in red to mostly correct as uh, denoted in blue. So here it's worth stepping back and remarking upon one of the real advantages of the V information framework. And that advantage is that we can compare different data sets, not only different data sets for the same task, but different data sets for different tasks um, along the same scale and compare their distributions along the same axis. And this is very helpful for being able to um, compare models, but also build more difficult data sets um, and iterate upon the data sets that we already have, as I'll talk about a bit more in the future. This kind of analysis is very difficult to do um, with existing methods that I mentioned on a previous slide, because they don't account for the fact that across different um, data sets and even tasks, you're dealing with um, totally different label distributions. So despite its relative simplicity, the V information framework is uh, really amenable to conducting comparisons across a diverse set of um, tasks and data sets. Now, we can also compare different instances uh, in the same data set. And we can do this by estimating the PVI for the same model family V, for the same input X, for the same label Y, before and after transformations. To see how this works, let's look at two examples from the SMLI data set. So here we have the first example in purple, which is little kids play a game of running around the pole. Uh, and the hypothesis being the kids are fighting outside. So the label for this is contradiction because the hypothesis does not entail the premise. And in the second example, in pink, we have the premise, a group of people watching a boy getting interviewed by a man, and a hypothesis, uh, a group of people are sleeping on Pluto. So we have another contradiction example. Of these two examples, Intuitively, we would think that the first one is more difficult than the second. And the reason for this is that the second example is a lot more jarring than the first, right? The hypothesis for the second um, contains the planet Pluto, which just sort of comes out of nowhere. It, is, it seems orthogonal to the premise, whereas the hypothesis in the first example is not as distant from the premise. So it might take a moment to figure out that it is indeed a contradiction. And so intuitively, you know, if we use our common sense, we would think that purple should be more difficult than pink. And let's see if we can arrive at the same conclusion with the PVI analysis. So if we just look at the untransformed inputs, we can see that, um, the purple example has a slightly lower PVI than the pink one. That is, it is indeed more difficult for uh, Bert in this case to predict the purple example than the pink one, as we would expect. Now, if we try to understand why this was the case, we can apply different transformations to these examples and then measure the PVI value again. And if we did that, we would notice that Shuffling the tokens doesn't really distinguish the two. The PVI values is about the, sh uh, is about the same for the shuffled examples. If we just isolated the premise alone, um, there again wouldn't be much, different between, much difference between the PVI estimates. But if we isolate the hypotheses, then we would observe that there is in fact a big difference in the PVI values between the pink example and the purple one. That is, as you know, our own common sense reasoning discovered, um, it's really the fact that the hypothesis in the pink example is more jarring uh, 
uh, is what makes the example easier predict, easier to predict, not only for us, but also for the uh, model as well. And so this kind of analysis can be done at scale using the B information framework. In a study, in an, another experiment, we found that um, the inter-annotator uh, disagreement was basically, it correlated strongly with um, uh, PVI estimates of difficulty. That is what annotators disagreed on most also had uh, the lowest um, PVI values, suggesting that those were what models also found most difficult. Now, we can also compare different slices of the data by estimating the PVI value, the average PVI value for each slice. Now, you may be asking yourself, why is this even necessary to begin with if we can just estimate the V information for that slice of data? Well, that doesn't always make sense to do. For example, if the slices of data contained um, examples from only one class, then the V information would be zero because it would be trivially, trivially easy to just predict that one class for that one slice of data. And so in that case, if we wanted to understand the relative difficulty of the different classes of data, we would need to use the average PVI values instead of, we would need to use the average PVI values instead. So here we conduct that kind of analysis, um, again, for the SNLI data set, uh, to say consistent, to try to find which subset of examples in this data set are most difficult for BERT. And we find that what BERT finds hardest, that is the slice of data with the lowest average PVI, are entailment examples where uh, there is a little to no overlap between the hypothesis and the premise which is denoted uh, in blue on the, on the legend there. So this makes a lot of intuitive sense, right? So entailment is often accompanied by a great deal of overlap between the hypothesis sentence and the premise sentence. So if this kind of textual overlap does not exist or is minimal, then it stands to reason that Bert would find this difficult to predict as entailment. Conversely, of all the slices of data, what the model, what BERT finds easiest to uh, predict, that is the slice of data with the highest average PVI, are contradiction examples where there is no overlap. And so, as we saw with the Pluto example a couple of slides earlier, if, they're, if the hypothesis and the premise are totally orthogonal and totally unrelated, then the model finds it fairly easy to predict contradiction, and it turns out it would be right most of the time. We can also use uh, B information to discover annotation artifacts. So in case you're unfamiliar, annotation artifacts are spurious correlations in the data that make a task simpler than that make a data set simpler than the task it purports to reflect. And they're called annotation artifacts because they often come into existence because annotators want to minimize the amount of effort that's involved in creating these data sets. And so if we look at the drop in V information after leaving out a token, we can discover token level annotation artifacts in the data. So here we have some artifacts from COLA, which you might recall is a grammaticality detection data set. So we see that for grammatical examples, there aren't really any token level artifacts. That is leaving out the token, uh, there's no token that when left out really uh, makes grammaticality easier or harder to predict. However, ungrammaticality is a totally different story. And we see that both auxiliary verbs such as is and was and prepositions such as of and in are artifacts of ungrammaticality. That is, when left out, the lack of grammaticality becomes much more difficult to predict for the BERT model. <laughs> 
We can ask even more complex questions about our data set by conditioning out information. So for example, let's say we wanted to figure out how much information X contains about Y that is not already encoded in a variable phi. So here we have an analog of V information called conditional V information, which was introduced by um, Hewitt et al, a, a work on which I was a co-author. And here the idea is that instead of um, instead of initially trading on a null variable, we train on a we, we try to predict y using some baseline features phi. And then we also include these features phi when trying to use X to predict the label as well. And so in doing so, we can effectively condition out any information that may be contained in the variable phi. And so this allows us to ask us really complex questions about a data set. For example, there is a popular benchmark for hate speech detection called DWMW17. Uh, where the goal is to basically predict whether a tweet um, constitutes offensive speech or hate speech or neither. And we found that the vast majority of the information that was contained about the hate speech label was contained in about 50 or so potentially offensive words, right? So offensive tokens like swear words, racial slurs, um, and et cetera. So for one, this suggests that a lot of, you know, what we consider hate speech detection is actually a lot simpler um, than we think. All you have to, a lot of the work just comes down to identifying these um, potentially offensive words. But, you know, if we, we can take this a step further and ask a more complex question, like how much information do, do these offensive tokens contain about the hate speech label that's not already in the sentiment of the text, right? In other words, is the information that the offensive tokens contains about the hate speech, is that mediated via the sentiment? And so we can answer this question by using the conditional V information framework. And we found that very little of the information that these offensive tokens contain about the label is mediated by the sentiment. There's only you know, a slight drop in the amount of usable information that the offensive tokens contain about the label if we condition on the sentiment. And this is not an all too surprising finding if you think about it, because these offensive tokens, um, usually they're all negative in nature, right? So some may be more negative than another, but overall, the differences in uh, the sentiment are not significant enough uh, to explain how useful these tokens are to detecting the overall hate speech label. So one interesting line of future work that can be uh, that we're looking into, and which I explore uh, you as the audience to also look into, is to use the V information framework for data checklisting. So about two years ago, or, I, or two years, I think, uh, there was a very famous paper in NLP called um, Checklists for Evaluating Models, where the goal is that you know, we apply different perturbations to, to the data to understand where models fail. And it's a very basic common sense idea that turned out to be very helpful for practitioners because it automated uh, model behavior analysis at scale. And so we can do something very similar with data checklists by using the V information framework. Now here we have like um, a table where the columns represent uh, what we're using as the predictor and the rows represent what we're conditioning on. So for example, in the top left square, we have zero because if we try to predict uh, the label using feature phi after conditioning out all the information in feature phi, then there would be no information left. And similarly, phi prime denotes everything in the text that doesn't fall into feature phi. So 
again, the diagonal is zero because if you condition on feature, condition out all the information on feature phi, then try to predict why using feature phi, you know, nothing's going to be left. And then in the bottom right square, we have the usual V information setup where we're not conditioning anything out, we're just using X to predict Y. Now, one thing we can do is basically do a feasibility test that we want to ensure that a particular feature contains some usable information about the label um, by making sure that the V information from phi X to Y is non-zero. So if you might recall, several slides ago, we found that um, the, the order of the tokens what did not hold a, a lot of usable information about the label in the SNLI data set, even though intuitively we would want it to, given that SNLI fundamentally is describing a causal relationship. And so here, if we're constructing a data, a new NLI data set, we might want to run this feasibility uh, check where we isolate the impact of word of token ordering and we want it to uh, have non zero usable information about the entailment label. And this doesn't have to be zero on the right hand side. It can be, you know, whatever threshold you seem you deem fit. But es essentially, we want phi to contain some uh, usable information about the label. A second test we can run is what I'd call the exclusivity test. In other words, there should be no information uh, about the label outside of feature phi. That is, if we isolated, if we removed everything from the input that was not in feature phi, we would get phi prime of x. And it, by enforcing this to be zero, we're essentially asserting via this test that feature phi has a monopoly on all of the information um, about label Y. A third test we can run is a sufficiency test where the goal is to make sure that a particular feature is sufficient for um, predicting the label. That is, you know, there can be a lot of extraneous information in the input that's not terribly helpful, but as long as, uh, but if we condition out all of the information in phi of x, then really there should be nothing more useful needed to predict, uh, to predict label y. And lastly, we can come up with a necessity check, which is that if we condition out um, phi prime, that is we condition out everything that's not in feature phi, then the amount of usable information from x to y is non-zero. That in other words, uh, feature phi is necessary to predict some part of label y, and that if we want to predict, if we want to extract all of the usable information about the label, then it must be left in the input x. It cannot be left out. And the other two squares are also a type of um, exclusivity check and feasibility check that uh, we don't really need to get into here. There are all the other uh, lines of future work as well that um, are promising to work on. One is we can make data sets more difficult by identifying why a data set is easy. For example, by isolating the, uh, by figuring out if a certain attribute of the input is not really useful for, or is too useful for predicting the label, and so useful in fact that it may be an annotation artifact, we can diagnose this during the data set creation process and edit the data set such that the data set is made more difficult um, via, uh, via the edit. A second direction is to apply the V-usable information framework to other modalities. So coming from an NLP background, 
all the experiments in this paper were done in the NLP setting, but there's nothing restricting the reusable information to NLP. You can apply it to computer vision, for example, by isolating different parts of the image and finding out what makes the task of image classification difficult. Is it the color of the image? Is it uh, the shapes? Is it the lines? For example, if I blurred the image and made it hazy, would that make object classification more difficult? Possibly, likely. And we can apply similar such transformations, but in the computer vision domain. And of course, we can apply the same framework to time series data, audio data, tabular data, really any domain. There's nothing specific about this to NLP. And lastly, we can use this framework for data pruning. So some recent work has found that uh, it is much more efficient to train models on only the most difficult examples. And by doing so, we can go from uh, power laws for uh, scaling models to exponential scaling laws, as shown in a recent paper by uh, Surya Ganguly et al. at Stanford. So the high level idea is that if you can tr only identify the sort of hard to learn examples in a data set and you train on them for a longer period of time, that's usually more efficient than just trying to train on the sort of overall mass of data where you don't know how difficult um, the examples are. And so we can use the V information framework to identify which examples in the training data set are most difficult and only train on those to potentially speed up um, model training and make it more efficient. So in summary, uh, what, v in, what the V usable information framework is, is that it's a unified framework for interpreting data set, interpreting data sets in which we can conduct all five of the key comparisons that we need to make for data set interpretability. And this is a particularly important direction of research, I believe, because there's been a lot of work on model interpretability in deep learning, but a lot less work on data set interpretability. However, as we converge, um, increasingly converge on you know, a particular set of architectures and a set of consents and a consensus uh, for what models to use, it becomes more it becomes increasingly important to be selective about what we're putting into these models and how we're training them. And that's where data set interpretation comes in. So to recap, with the V information framework, we can not only compare two different models, we can also compare two different data sets, uh, two different slices of the same data set, two different instances of the same data set with respect to a given distribution, and also different input attributes, all under the same framework. And we look forward to what the ML community, both in NLP and beyond, uh, will do with this framework in data set interpretation. Thank you so much.